should have started streaming now, Rob. Cheers. Thanks, Ed. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's meeting with the Workers' Party of Britain and Dr. Rangjeet Bra. Now, this is the third, I think, in our series of meetings on the subject of economics, the economics of capitalism. And tonight, the subject we're looking at specifically is wages and money. So thank you very much, Dr. Rangjeet Bra. If you're ready to speak, you can... Uh, Unmute yourself. Thanks very much, Rob. Is everyone hearing me okay? Fine, I think. Perfect. Good. Um, so I'm uh, speaking to you from work today. I'm sorry about that. I've had a series of emergency operations, the last of which I've only just finished. Um, so I've grabbed some food, had a shower, and I'm joining you. If I'm a little unprepared, you'll forgive me. I think I'm reasonably prepared, and hopefully you'll find what I have to say 
interesting. Um, I learned today um, while at work in between cases, I was reading the news. I learned today that the NHS, in addition to having 10 million patients who are waiting appointments and operations, 10 million, that's the largest the waiting list has ever been in my lifetime. And while allegedly that's simply attributable to the coronavirus pandemic, it's not. It's attributable to the fact that the coronavirus pandemic has seen our hospitals overwhelmed and normal activity stopped. And that didn't have to be the case. That wasn't the case in other countries. That's because the endemic running down of our health service. Now, well, how will the government respond to this? I read quite a nice book once. I don't agree with everything in it, but it was by Naomi Klein and it was called The Shock Doctrine. And on the basis of any particular crisis, the ruling class of the day can use that crisis to drive home pre-planned ideas, pre-planned uh, schemes that it was going to anyway, but it hangs them on the contingency of that crisis. And they very conveniently announced today that 10 billion pounds, 10 billion pounds would be found to, because of the waiting list, to farm out patients to the private system. The private system, which is also failing, because they're unable to carry on with their activity in the presence of the coronavirus crisis, the NHS is going to rescue them, or rather our government is gonna rescue them by giving them 10 billion of NHS money. And it's this constant drive um, towards privatization um, that leads us as socialists to constantly say, we don't want a private system, we want a public system. Constantly, we are told that the private system is the most efficient. Constantly, we're told that it's some kind of utopia and pie in the sky and that the money has to come from somewhere. So it's a very good time to go back to some essential basics of money and say, where does money come from? And I've prepared a little slideshow with you for you. I hope I can share that with you now. Are you seeing that okay? So this is the third in our series. Uh, George would obviously normally be speaking to us. You know, George has uh, recently had his third child with Gatry, and so we wish them well. Uh, Oban is doing well and mum is doing well, I hear. And that's fantastic news. But we're going to take this opportunity to continue with our series of lectures or talks around what just uh, is the real meaning, the essence of the word socialism. And today we're going to talk about commodity production. The first two lectures we discussed previously, politi political economy, just what that means, and how society became capitalist. Now we're going to look at what is really the cell, the essence of the commodity productive system of capitalism, okay, commodity production. So commodity production we saw in some of our last uh, couple of sessions is not something that begins with capitalism, but capitalism is characterized by Commodity production as being the general form of production. That means overwhelmingly people are producing not to consume themselves, but in order to sell and exchange on the market. And labor power, work, our ability to work itself becomes a commodity, something that can be bought and sold. And this is particularly characteristic of the commodity system. But what exactly is a commodity? commodity a commodity can be any item of goods. And if you see that little picture there, got a barrel of oil, some corn, coffee, uh, coal, gold, aluminium, silver, copper, wheat, anything can be a commodity. The point of a commodity is not what it is, but the way in which it is produced. And in particular, it's being produced for sale rather than consumption, okay, rather than directly to eat. There are a few characteristic features that we'll reflect upon as uh, from the beginning before we go further. Uh, and one of those uh, is the fact that production is carried on without a plan. Okay, so a capitalist owns factories and plants. He produces products, each brings his product to the market, but no one has told him what to produce or how much to produce. And as a result of that, He's not sure whether he's going to meet with a market for his goods or not. And those pictures I've got over there are actually from the 2009 crisis, when there was again a generalized crisis of uh, 
commodity production, when markets were glutted, when the people were impoverished and couldn't buy them. And there were huge stockpiles we were seeing of all kinds of goods all over the world. And one of them was cars and many different cities being produced, but without a market. So it's this anarchy of production, production without a plan, which is very characteristic of commodity production. Because profit, as far as the capitalist is concerned, is the sole motivator for production. We saw the you know, unusual, almost incredible spectacle of negative oil uh, not many months ago, okay, in March and April uh, of this year, 2020, we saw markets were so glutted that oil was not just uh, uh, free, it, it was a negative value. So that meant if you had the facility to store oil, you could actually get a profit by taking it off the hands of those who had it because they were producing it without anywhere to put it. They were totally glutted. They needed to get rid of it. And the, and the speculation that the, product, that the market was still going down led to a negative price of oil. So maximization of profit is the capitalist creed, which leads him. He doesn't really care whether the food or the population has enough uh, uh, food, uh, clothing, shelter, culture, whether they have the necessities of life. He's trying to maximize his profit. And yet, precisely through neglecting the well-being of the worker, who's at the end of the day, the end market for all goods that are produced by impoverishing them. You come to these periodic crises where actually, despite wanting to maximize profit, they're having to get, they can't give goods away. They literally can't give goods away. And this is a periodic feature of commodity production. And another feature that we have is that as a result of the generation of these super wealthy individuals, we have in reality an oligarchy, the rule of the few, a plutocracy, the rule of the wealthy, the rule of money. We've got a picture there of the governor of the Bank of England. He's, he's approaching the end of his term. He's going to be uh, uh, giving up his role, Mark Carney. Mark Carney, uh, uh, Tony Blair, in fact, and Gordon Brown, when they first came to power, one of the very first acts they committed was to give control of macroeconomic policy away. Say, we don't want it. It should be with the market. The capitalists know best. The capitalists must govern production. The capitalists must govern the economy. And they gave us huge... Um, in a lever of power away to Mark Carney. Mark Carney is not just some independent chap. He sits there, his successor there, he's, he's sitting with uh, um, uh, Rishi Sunak, you can see there. And this government, this government of functionaries, uh, these uh, committee of the Bank of England who decide whether your mortgage is gonna be payable or not. Right now, our negative, uh, we have uh, very low interest rates. They decide tomorrow to put them up and up and up. They're not doing so in the face of the impoverishment of the working people. They can't um, do it because they risk mass defaults. But if they decide to, they can turn even more people homeless in a very short period of time. But all of these people ultimately represent the interests of a government of money. And if you want to know really who is in control, if you want to know really who our democracy is responsible for, who pays the lobbyists, who are the people who walk in and out of government and decide which policies can and can't go, which wars will or won't be fought, uh, which people will do well, which people will be oppressed and pressed upon by our system of taxation, and which jobs will be present and which won't. You have to look no further really uh, than the Forbes rich list. And you know I've got the 20 richest people there. These things change and fluctuate all the time, but Jeff Bezos is still very much up there. Bill Gates is up there. Mark Zuckerberg is up there, uh, Mukesh Ambani, Lakshmi Mittal, uh, all of these names, uh, which are household names. Actually, people like Ger you know, um, uh, Richard Branson are relatively small fry, though these billionaires also play a major part in our economy and have a major stake in our health service. But really, we can see that the, the capitalist class, wherever it's got the upper hand, has put an end to all feudal and patriarchic, patriarchal idyllic relations. They've got rid of the idea that people should be taken care of, that people should be held up with reverend awe. It's pitilessly torn asunder. All of the ties that held society together under feudalism, under former orders of society, where everyone knew their place, but equally everyone was taken care of. And there are progressive aspects to that. But what's it left in its place? No connection between man and man, the naked self-interest, callous cash payment. And it wants to elevate this to be the ultimate philosophy in the Ayn Randian manner of all society, but we very much reject it. Capitalism organizes and regulates the working class. 
and this is a small quote about Taylorism. The Taylor system was the system of mechanization of the production line that was adopted by Henry Ford um, and subsequently by most uh, factory production lines in which really man feels himself to be enslaved by machines, perhaps not characteristic of Britain, the, 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 the essence of Britain's economy. Britain has increasingly become a service economy, but still those jobs are here. They're still wealth creating jobs. And this is still the manner in which the vast majority of products are produced around the world. So capitalism organizes and regulates the labor within the factory for the further oppression of the worker in order to increase his own profit. But in social production as a whole, chaos remains and grows greater, bringing on crises when the accumulated wealth and we have wealth in abundance, untaxed wealth in abundance, tr trillions and trillions uh, of wealth which can't be productively engaged. But precisely because the workers have been impoverished and can't buy the goods, production is in crisis, production ceases, and that accumulated wealth finds no purchases. So the goods that they are going to produce can't be sold. And as a result, increasing numbers are put onto the scrap heap of unemployment and without an adequate social safety net and more and more people, perhaps four to five million people are classed as destitute in Britain, the sixth richest country on earth and hundreds of millions and billions around the world are in this condition. Those people go hungry precisely because they've produced so much wealth for this tiny government of money, this tiny oligarchy. So what then is the commodity and how did we reach this uh, situation. So the wealth of societies in which the capitalist mode of production prevails presents itself as an immense accumulation of commodities, of things, of things to be sold, okay, as unit being the single commodity. And I've got some examples there. We think of the market, when we think of the market, we, you know, we might think of a fruit and veg stall in the east end of London, that, one, that particular photo I've got there, it's actually from Blackpool, but also, you know, steel production, aluminium, rolled aluminium, and that's ingots of aluminium, all these things. I could have shown you a thousand pictures of the goods that we use. They're all commodities. Commodities have different properties, but in particular, they have two properties, okay? They have a use. Every commodity, everything that must be sold, must first of all satisfy some human want. Otherwise, it wouldn't be worth wasting any labor on trying to produce it. So whether we're talking about buildings in the construction industry, whether we're talking about cars, whether we're talking about footwear, coffee, tea, whatever, that commodity must have a use, something, some desirable aspect to it. And if you look at modern capitalist economics, if you study economics, people go on and on about this and they essentially fetish, fetishize the people's desire for things. How much is something worth? Well, it's as much as worth, it's worth as much as you want to pay. If you, uh, spend a lot of money like Nike on branding, advertising, well, you've increased the value of that commodity because now the brand image is worth so much on top of the base production. This is all nonsense, okay? All commodities have to have a use or they're not worth spending labor on, but that doesn't tell you real, really the other property of a commodity, which is its exchange value. I, how much it is worth, how much of one kind of commodity exchanges with another and it's confused economists for many years and it continues to do so we talked a little bit about adam smith and david ricardo in our previous uh, talks and really the question is commodities can be exchanged like we can swap them with each other but the real question is in what ratio does any commodity exchange how do we measure the exchange value of a commodity what is it worth all of these terms have several meanings and therefore it's confusing. But when I talk about value uh, today, I'm gonna to ask, I'm gonna really talk about exchange value. If I have this much tea and you have that much iron, how should we exchange it in what ratio? How do we work it out? So exchange value or simply value presents itself first of all, as the proportion, the ratio in which a certain number of use values of one kind, so come on my tea, <laughs> is gonna exchange for a certain number of use values of another time, type your shoes, okay? How then do we work out? And this is a is a is something that's dogged economics from the beginning. So there's a all of this, the fact that we're producing things to sell rather than to consume ourselves as the original um, 
primitive societies did, as even the peasant households did, and even within early capitalism, as most households did, they had their own allotments, their own fields, they grew their own grain, they tanned their own leather, they made their own uh, crops, they made their own stew, they even weave their own cloth, they spun their own yarn, they churned their own butter. All of these are still things that I saw as a child going to India and visiting my relatives, people churning their own butter, so producing, you know, having their own buffaloes, making their own milk. So all of these things are producing for themselves and natural economy are broken down. And increasingly under capitalism, we don't do that. We have specialization of production. So you have a consumer and a producer, and there's a division of labor. All of it shows a further division of labor, a specialization of um, production. And that means as in this picture, when there's a baker producing bread, that bread, as far as the baker's concerned, not all going to be eating themselves. They might eat one or two loaves a day for them and their family. But the vast majority of it for them has no use value. They don't, they can't eat it all. For them, it only has exchange value. They're going to take it to the market, hopefully sell it and realize its worth in order to exchange for other products. For the consumer, for the person who buys the bread, on the other hand, it's got use value. And he has to give something in exchange, which has, embodies the exchange value, the worth of that commodity. And it's this division of labor which is contained upon the commodity. So it hides a relation between people who are coming together in a social way to produce different things and exchange them. So a social division of labor is hidden behind an individual thing, the commodity. And this is one of the things which becomes increasingly hard to work out for economists and hides and uh, gives rise to a number of problems within our society which are not immediately apparent. So commodity is the agent of a definite social connection. The bread, in this case, is the agent of the connection existing between the producer of the commodity, in this case the baker, and society as a whole. The baker is baking bread for society, or collectively all the bakers in society are breaking bread for society, and as of course we go on and, and production develops, you get bigger and bigger breakers, Alison, uh, who uh, producing more and more, a greater and greater share of the entire market of the whole bread for the whole country. But the connection is indirect. Society doesn't tell each producer just what and how much to produce. There's no planned and conscious guidance of the entire process of production in, ex in society. And so very different and really incomparable use values. You know, how can you compare watches and coffee, tea and sugar? Um, pig iron and a car, you know, very different use values, but they're all exchanged. So they must have something in common. And if we leave out of consideration the differences, what, what can't be compared, their chemical composition, the way in which they're used, they're attractive. If we, if we leave out all of that, what do we have left within each of them, which is common, that can be compared? We have only the fact, their common property, but they're products of labor, of human labor. And this was the labor theory of value put forward by the uh, capitalist political economist, David Ricardo, uh, many years ago. He said the value of a commodity, so the exchange value, uh, or the quantity of any other commodity for which it will exchange depends upon the relative quantity of labor which is necessary for its production. So it's how much working time there is within it that determines its value. That's the labor theory of value. It's not generally recognized to be the case, but without it, we're really powerless to understand. You know, by just saying supply and demand, by just singing Psalms that says capitalism is the perpetual state, it's the highest state of existence and there's nothing higher. And there's, you know, it's the, it's the least world system and it's the great equalizer and all ship, you know, all, it's the uh, rising tide upon which all ships ride. All of this is just meaningless. It doesn't allow us to really understand the nature of commodity production. And then therefore the nature of the crisis it throws up and the manner of the solution for a rational way forward to society. So exchange value was at first accidental uh, and then more and more conscious. Uh, so when people came together in an early way, they just swapped things. I have this, you have that. We would like to exchange. But increasingly, people were, as exchange become more um, regular, okay, a regular part of society throughout slave societies, throughout uh, the primitive um, early civilization, if you like, and throughout the feudal system, when exchange um, became more and more regular, 
each participant in that trade really was aware of how hard it was for them to produce the good they were exchanging and would use that in their reckoning. So it became increasingly um, apparent. And this is again, just talking about how can we compare these feathers going into feather pillows, goose down pillows, and this pig iron, which is gonna make steel and the girders and beams for extension on your loft or the high rise building in the city of London. How can we compare and exchange them? because we must seek out in all things, if we're going to compare them, a common unit, what's common between them, how do we determine their value, their exchange value, and the common unit is the quantity of labor time, how much time it took to produce that particular commodity. And there's a number of things which kind of back that up. Uh, as less labor time is necessary to produce, particularly complex items, um, and technology items, we see that over time, they become cheaper. When plasma screen TVs first turned up uh, in my youth in the 80s, and I would go to Tottenham Court Road and have a look at them and go, wow, amazing plasma screen TV. They're rubbish now. But uh, they used to cost 10, 15, 20,000 pounds for a single screen. Now you can buy bigger screens of a better technology, mass produced, and you can buy the same screen for 1,000, 2,000. So a tendency of prices to decrease over time as they're mass produced and the amount of labor in them actually goes down. A lithium ion uh, uh, battery, I saw that one and I also was tempted to put up there. Of course, with simple commodities we extracted from the ground, a question of their availability is there. And we know that these questions, these real market questions of how to cheaply obtain a commodity that is necessary for production. So lithium ion battery being very topical, precisely because battery technology is a key component of so many modern products and obviously electric cars being one of them. And there are, of course, uh, American producers uh, of these batteries, uh, of these cars, who have openly said, you know, that uh, they were quite prepared to have a coup against governments where these commodities are contained. So Evo Morales' government uh, in Bolivia was overthrown by one of these very common color revolutions in which essentially Wall Street decided they can't get their hands on a commodity cheaply enough. And in order to do so, they were gonna get rid of a whole uh, government of another country. So it's not democracy that our this oligarchy, this government of money strives for. The market that comes above everything else. What they strive for is domination and they're quite prepared to overturn the democracy of entire other countries and declare the whole of you know, entire continents to be the um, playground, the living room, the Lebensraum, uh, the backyard, okay, the sphere of interests of their own a group of powerful capitalists. But if you look there, for example, at the metal detector, complex bit of technology, and that's over a long period of time, you can see despite all the oscillations which will reflect supply and demand of different components, despite the increase in technology overall, in terms, in, in real terms, so purchasing power terms, there's a gradual decrease of the cost of technology as production becomes mass production, then actually there's less overall labor time embodied in a single commodity. So in that sense, there's an, becomes an increasing abundance of commodities in the world, more and more, cheaper and cheaper. Um, and that shows you but this assumption that I've made, which many of you may have heard, some of you may not have heard, that the real value, the exchange value, the amount of money ultimately that something is worth comes down to the how hard it was to produce, how many labor hours, necessary labor hours went into producing it. Okay. So in exchange, uh, we compare all these kinds of varied labor. And when I say that the amount of labor necessary to produce it, you might say quite reasonably, what do you mean labor? How can you compare, you know, the labor of someone who's excavating a road, the labor of someone who's mining, the labor of someone who's baking, the labor of a surgeon, the labor of a, um, of a lawyer, the labor of an insurance broker? How can you compare them? Well, all the labor power of a given society represented in the sum total of the values of all commodities. So if you look at the whole production of an entire modern economy per year, it's basically composed of one and the same labor power. So you have to talk about average labor power, millions and millions of exchange, exchange transactions prove that. We're talking about is million, millions of accumulated hours of labor. And so therefore we're talking, just as we talked about use value, the value of a sandwich to me, but equally, um, if a sandwich shop buys it, 
it's selling them for a certain quantity. So there's, there's a division between use value and exchange value, how much money ultimately it'll be worth. There's a difference between general labor, which is a way we can make these economic calculations rational, and the abstract individual concrete labor necessary to produce any particular item. And so therefore we can say that, that you know, the work of the baker, the work of the watchmaker, the work of the miner can all be equated in some relation and thought of as general manpower of general abstract human labor. They are all the product of, they are all human labor, human labor processes. They will produce goods which are uh, desirable and useful to society. And therefore they can all be thought of and equated uh, on that basis and indeed valued and exchanged on that basis. So to produce a commodity, a man must not only produce an article satisfying some social want, but his labor itself must form part and parcel of the sum total of labor expended by society. It must be subordinate to the division of labor within society. One is nothing without the other. Okay, but we keep on saying, and it's worth coming back to, the individual who produces is blind to that division. And he only realizes that division when he takes his good to market. And in that way, this social relation that we're all coming together in a complex society to produce the things that society needs is hidden. It's hidden behind an apparently supernatural connection between these things that are exchanging on the market, uh, which we apparently have no control over. So this contradiction, which consists in the social nature of the individual labor of independent producers arises with commodity production. But that contradiction, which gives rise to so much dislocation, disharmony, destruction, war within our own society also doesn't have to go on forever. Just as it arose with the dominance of commodity production, it will disappear, okay? So it wasn't present before that in natural economy products didn't rule man. Mankind struggled in early civilization to produce enough to satisfy and feed and clothe him. In our own society, we've got an abundance of goods that can't be sold. And yet there are people who are going hungry and starving who can't produce them. It seems that the goods themselves, the commodities themselves, the markets that societies produce have some kind of supernatural dominance over society. But as we move forward, there is a way forward through socialism, which again can rationalize, um, can create a rational plan for production, and mankind will again gain sovereignty over this apparently blind acting supernatural force of the market and decide what should be produced, how much should be produced, and ensure that it is produced so that all can satisfy their needs. And that will be a socialist planned economy. And that is precisely the answer to the current problems we're experiencing. Labor, of course, must be socially necessary. It's not the case that if I go back to producing shoes by hand as a cobbler um, or a very lazy operative produces half the amount to twice that of his uh, industrious neighbor, that, that my goods will be worth more because there's more labor time in them. No, we take labor as socially necessary labor. And that means it must be the labor required to produce an article under normal conditions of production with an average degree of skill and intensity prevalent at the time. So there has to be an average productivity of labor by which you can say this is what's expected of a modern productive labor hour. And actually that varies from country to country. So there are places where labor is more and less productive. It varies with technology. It varies with time and place. So there are variations in the productivity of labor, but any one stage, there'll be an average of that, and that will be the socially necessary time. And those who very heavily invest in technology can reduce the socially necessary time to produce. And in so doing, they'll actually gain an extra profit by selling at the market rate. And that will be the rationale for constant mechanization under capitalism, but there are converse rationales as well, that if you get very, very cheap labor, it still remains profitable to produce by virtual slave labor, certain footballs uh, in the third world. You see child labor being employed in poor countries at pitifully low rates. And actually that does turn out to be profitable. Walmart make a huge amount of their money in that way. And Walmart, there are three or four of the, wall, of the, of the Walmart family 
uh, who figure in the billionaire top 20 list. Uh, incredible profits to be made still from very low skill, low mechanized labor. So the concept that everything's about to be robotized and will all be redundant is also not true of today's society when you look at it. The labor is not labor. So someone who digs, someone who is a watchmaker, someone I've put there as an example of the highest skill of, uh, of labor, surgical time, I don't know why I did that, but anyway, there are gradations of labor. And simply, we can relate complex labor to the simple labor, the more training necessary to go into it, uh, the more highly remunerated it is, but essentially, we're talking about products of human labor. That's not something which disproves the law. On the contrary, it shows you that it really is in effect that those very, very skilled occupations that take years to study, you know, that means years where you're not earning anything at all. You know, you, the only way a market can regulate producing people who will do that is actually by saying, well, then we'll actually, you'll be able to get more in terms of your wages at the end of it. So skilled and simple labor, Nevertheless, all of their products are products of human labor. Uh, uh, prices or value, so uh, for, for goods to realize uh, their exchange value, they have to be taken to the market and sold. Can products always be exchanged for their full value? Well, no, they can't. And that is dependent on supply and demand. If you talk about modern economics, uh, apart from just uh, talking about the, the desire, the human desire for products, they will talk a great deal about supply and demand. They will show you graphs such as this, where they basically show when quantity, <laughs> when um, demand outstrips supply and goods are in short supply, then the price goes up. When supply outstrips demand and there's a glut of goods, the price goes down and that they say leads to regulation of production it's a beautiful system because production will, all, will always produce the right amount it'll be regulated by the market no higher regulator than market the state must never interfere none of that explains the real value none of it explains the amount of labor necessary to produce an item is the reason that someone something actually has a certain exchange value it's the reason why a pencil no matter how much i desire that pencil will never cost more to buy than a house. Um, even if there's a huge glut of houses, even if there's a real dearth of pencils, just the sheer amount of labor time necessary to build a house can't be compared to a pencil. And so we must bear in mind the limitations of capitalist economics as they're taught to us, still taught to us in schools and universities. The law of value, this law of how things achieve their value appears to be a blind force of the market. Price is the monetary expression of value, but the seller doesn't know the demand in advance. He doesn't know when he puts his goods onto the market if all of his effort has been worthwhile, or in fact, he won't be able to sell his goods at all. And therefore, the theory of value assumes um, that there's an equal supply and demand, which rarely is the case in capitalist society and certainly doesn't account for the periodic crises that we see. I'm going to very quickly talk about the way exchange developed. Um, there's not a lot more in my in my talk. I hope that you've um, followed the very simple things that I've said. Um, but when exchange is accidental, okay, um, simple goods were exchanged with each other only occasional. So if I come and I meet someone who's got a nice axe and I've been hunting and I've got a skin, we exchange them. And for me, when I give away the skin, the skin's of no um, use value to me. I've got another skin, but I, I want that axe. I desire it. He, so your axe has the use value I desire and my skin only essentially serves the purpose of exchange value, okay? So it's only in terms of my skin that I can give a value, uh, a, a price, if you like, to that axe. As exchange becomes more and more regular, I might regularly see that I can exchange my skin actually for a whole variety of things and come to generalize that relationship and that's generally called the expanded form of value so i still see my skin only as something uh, to be given away only as something with which i can embody the exchange value of other things that i want and i see the two axes i see the canoe i see the sack of corn as use values that i want whose value is alienated from them and expressed in terms of my skin it's a funny concept i'm gonna leave it there for now
soon we come to realize that within more and more sophisticated and specialized societies in which there's more division of labor and you can think of these early pre-civilization but also the early civilization so the slave societies we talked about of ancient rome and greece but this is seen throughout the world certain things come to be the embodiment of exchange value things in which um a surplus is often embodied and very often we see in many societies that came to be cattle so if you think as cattle being the generalized form of value and other people are regularly exchanging so they're putting everything else that they want to exchange in terms of the number of cattle it's worth so cattle might exchange for one canoe three uh, sacks of corn three amphora of wine four pairs of shoes or a, or a yard of cloth but what we can see there the ox is becoming the embodiment of the exchange value of all other commodities. So in fact, these two things which are present in the single commodity, that of being useful and that of being able to exchange for other products of human labor is present in all things that are produced. But gradually they came to be separated merely to fill, facilitate exchange. And those early things, very strange things that served as essentially an early form of money, a general form of value, uh, oxes, conch shells, colored beads. So certain things which simply facilitated exchange and in which the gradual you know societies gradually came to see the embodiment of exchange value and of course ultimately that ox was substituted for real money gold and silver those things um, now became gold and silver became a universal equivalent medium of exchange which everyone would accept as payment for their goods and everyone came to see their goods value as being a monetary value so something which was inherent in all commodities both a use value and an exchange value became separated out and the exchange value how much it was worth we can hardly say worth without thinking about money and money became that form um, and you know gold and silver became particularly useful in that context both because there was i mean gold and silver also have use value and exchange value. They've got chemical properties, electrical properties. Um, they can be used for art. They can be used in jewelry. So there are things that we use them for and find them desirable for, and they are used for those things still. And they also can serve as the embodiment of value and exchange for other commodities. So they still function actually at both these things, but we see them as separate. We see gold, we see money as something supernatural and separate from commodities, from production. And that's really what we're talking about. Money only comes about as a result of a division of labor and the fact that we need to exchange our products. And it's the properties of money that it's durable, could be divided. And there was a large amount of labor hours, labor time necessary to mine it and produce it in a small space that made it useful. And all kinds of societies around the world gradually came to adopt it as money. So use value was separated out. All commodities had their use value counterposed to the apparent exchange value only existing in money as initially characterized by gold, silver and other coins of other denominations. And that led to fetishism uh, of this money which persists to the day i was going to show you a video of liza minnelli singing money makes the world go around you know a supernatural power is ascribed to money okay relations between people appear as relations between things um but really this is we're just talking about a division of labor and that all of our separate production is part of a social um, productive process, but without a plan, realized through the, not the anarch, but the anarchy uh, of the market. So the commodity became a very puzzling thing, and our fate seems tied to them, apparently beyond our control. A money appears an almost supernatural entity, but money is simply exchange value inherent in all commodities. Money should act merely as a means of circulation, but money develops further uh, as capital. So a peculiar fact which runs throughout the whole of economics and which has caused utter confusion in the minds of the capitalist economists is that economics actually deals not with things but the relations between people and in the last resort between classes. Classes that we said have uh, definite groups of people that have certain relations to the means of production and in particular classes one class in society becomes able to live off the labor of another class in society. The capitalists live off the labor of the working class. But these relations are always attached to things, appear as things, they're hidden behind things. 
you might recognize that slide. We might not watch the same kind of shows as I watch. <laughs> Money leads to the growth and the development of those contradictions of commodity production. The commodity becomes at once a useful thing, a use value, okay, and money. Money really just being the embodiment of the exchange value inherent in all commodities. So, but the producer still needs to sell uh, in order to buy what he needs. So he takes his commodity, he needs to sell it to realize money, and then he can then take that money and buy other commodities. So money becomes separated out from the commodities as the embodiment of value. But if he's unable to, or different market conditions, particularly if the general mass of producers who form the ultimate market in a very extended system of commodity production of capitalism are impoverished to the point they can't buy. When he takes his goods to market, he finds he can't sell them and he is ruined. So money masks the social division of labor being the highest product of the development of exchange and of commodity production, money masks and hides the social character of individual labor, the social tie between all the different producers that the market has to bring together. And money functions as a number of ways. Okay, so the price is the expression of the exchange value, the labor time within a commodity in money. That's the thing that we're used to. But price fluctuates according to supply and demand around the value. It really exists, the value of an item, why, why a pencil will never be worth more than a, a house is because the amount of labor time necessary to produce it, but supply and demand, okay, do make the prices fluctuate and that confusing surface phenomenon, but around what do they fluctuate? Sometimes they sell below their value, sometimes above their value, but there is a real value really dependent on the amount of work necessary to produce something. And then money therefore becomes a means of evaluating a good for exchange, but it doesn't need to be present at the time of that exchange and it becomes the means of circulation and it's possible to abstract from the gold and silver which were real commodities with a high amount of value within them to symbols and tokens of that of that uh, value to facilitate exchange and that in again makes people think well where's that money coming from what about if all the money disappears but money the real value in society is represented by the sum total of the goods that that society produces and the total amount of money doesn't produce that good you can't eat the money but you can eat a sandwich you can't live in that money but you can live the house the total amount of houses the total amount of food that's being produced in a society is not determined by these abstract figures that we have in banks but they really are exchanged and exchanged on the basis of their relative value, value that's determined ultimately by the amount of work necessary to produce them. And therefore all that value can't evaporate. If we had a revolution tomorrow and the capitalists took all their um, uh, capital uh, in numbers, in banks away, we're still gonna be left with the goods with our ability to work. We cannot be robbed and impoverished when we are in control of society in control of the labor that produces all value, all worth and that's very important to bear in mind when people say there's not a magic money tree money doesn't grow on trees no money doesn't grow on trees it grows out of the labor out of the work of human beings of the working class in particular okay bear that in mind so money is also in our society the means of wealth someone has a large amount of wealth accumulated apparently doesn't have to work apparently doesn't have to do anything can live on the basis of that capital of the basis of that money off the labor of others uh, and it serves also the function of regulator of trade, balance of trade deficits between countries. But again, those are not ultimately any more backed by real amounts of gold in the banks, though those do exist. They're backed overall. Okay, it's a, it's a scam, yeah, but basically they're backed overall and they're linked to the relative economic power and military power of the governments who push their powerful currencies as the means of exchange in the world. So the law of value, all contradictions of our society have their roots in this commodity production, in the mask division of labor, and in the way in which goods exchange. The commodity, the single commodity, the things that is bought, that is produced and sold, is the cell of the capitalist economy and society. And it's most obvious in crisis, as the one we're seeing today, that the features of that commodity production are anarchy. An anarchy of production in which there's no ultimate regulator, in which there's no plan, uh, in which there's a uh, productive forces are massive, have the potential to produce wherewithal the goods necessary to satisfy all human wants. And yet the productive relations, the fact that they're all owned by a dwindling band of 
increasingly wealthy billionaires, the Jeff Bezoses of this world, the Warren Buffetts of this world, the Bill Gates of this world, have such a hold over production, okay? They have individual accumulations. These tiny number of people, six people, have the same number of wealth as half the planet's population. So these six people are accumulating, not money that they've made themselves, but the social product of the work of the whole world's productive economy in their hands. And when this socially produced wealth is taken away from the people who should ultimately get the goods, you know, it stands like this, this relation of production, the fact that these incredibly wealthy people have to make a profit before we can all eat and drink, stands in the way of us consuming the necessities of life. And it's this absurd contradiction that sees at this time of crisis, when there's 55 million unemployed in the States, when there's probably 10 million unemployed in Britain, when people are going hungry, when there's increasing dependence on food banks, actually there's a surfeit of goods. Every supermarket, you know, every day, throws away food or surreptitiously gives some to the food bank, but mainly throw it away. They prefer to throw it away to keep the market price high than satisfy the needs of the starving men, women, and children, some of them working, many of them working, many unemployed in our country. That's the absurd system, this anarchy of production in which there's a clash between individual accumulation of the billionaires and the social production of the whole of society. It simply doesn't any longer make sense cause the whole of our production to grind to a halt and the economic end crisis, which is endemic, which may have been triggered like the straw that broke the camel's back by the coronavirus pandemic, but was not caused by a coronavirus or any other virus. So the people who constantly talk about the conspiracy of corona to, it's not a conspiracy of corona, coronavirus is real, but that is not the root cause of all the inequality uh, 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 that we see in our society today, but a minuscule thing, you know, a thing that society should be able to cope with, that modern medical technology can cope with, triggers this chaos precisely because we're on the brink of it all the time, precisely because of commodity production, having put all the wealth of hands in the hands of a dwindling number of people and leaving vast masses of the world starving and hungry, despite the fact that they have produced more than they need to consume and labor power, and we're going to explore this more next time, the mechanism by which each individual worker is impoverished through their wages. Labor power itself becomes a commodity, so the workers uh, are not bought and sold like slaves, okay? There's not a market where they'll check my teeth, see if my hearing, see if my muscles are good enough, say, but yeah, but this one's good at X, Y, Z, he's got special skills, and directly barter for us. It's not like the feudal system where uh, I can work part of the time on my own estate producing for me, part of the time for the feudal manor, and that's theirs, and therefore it's very clear to every peasant and serf what's theirs and the degree to which they're exploited and have their product of their labor taken. And capitalism is hidden. We seem to get wages, we seem that we're paid for everything, but it's not clear that our labor time doesn't reflect the amount of value we produce. So we go to work for the capitalists, we produce for them, but our wages are just enough for us to survive some higher, some low, but just enough for us to survive. And that will be the essence of capitalist exploitation that we'll talk about more next time. But the fact that labor power becomes a commodity, our ability to work becomes something the capitalist can buy that produces value for the capitalist is what is at root of the mass impoverishment of vast waves of the working people of our world. 80, 90, 95% of the world live in relative penury uh, compared to the remaining portion and compared to this handful of billionaires. So capital currently has been victorious all over the world, though already we have seen the signs of social revolution of workers moving beyond it and solving these problems and saying they refuse to be impoverished by the billionaires. Capital has been victorious all over the world, but that victory is only the eve of the victory of workers over this absurd system of capitalist production. We don't have to leave our world in chains. I'm going to leave it there. I hope that's um, I've covered a little bit of economics and I've given you a little bit of commentary of, of the meaning of commodity production, how it affects us. I think that'll do for now, Rob. Uh, oh, sorry. I, I think it's um, uh, Ed. Is it not? Ed, I'll hand back to you. Brilliant, Ranji. Uh, another fantastic presentation uh, from most medic to uh, workers party economists. That's absolutely brilliant, mate. <laughs> Um, so go to people asking questions now. I can't see any hands in the chat up at the minute. Oh, Andrew Biggin.
Thanks ever so much, guys, and, and thank you uh, for your talk, Ren. G. am not sure how you do it in between surgery. You know, I thought I had a, sort of had a hard day, but I don't think I have compared to you, so thank you. Um, I thought your explanation of the market was brilliant. Um, you alluded to the fact that markets, I think, can be forced, they can be fixed. I've worked in the automotive business for many uh, years in various facets. And that's essentially how that business works. Manufacturers force the market. They decide at the start of each year how much they're going to produce. Those amounts of cars get produced no matter what happens. Um, this then has various uh, negative effects, which I'm not going to go into now. But I just wanted to make an observation on the market. I read somewhere, I'm not sure why, or sorry, or where, but the, the, the commentator I was reading was um, saying, talking about the market and saying it's not just a capital this idea it's not just a, it's not just a concept that um that defines how we buy and sell but it seems to be a, a neo-liberal idea if you like so the commentator was saying um and he said that this seems to be a symptom of the fact that we don't think there are intrinsic value anymore and that we're happy to subject everything in our lives to the rule of a market whether it be an election, whether it be a referendum, or whether it be a, a financial or economic market. Um, and I'll probably not explain that very well, but that got me thinking, and I just wondered what your view was and whether you thought this idea of a market actually seeps into more of our modern life than just economics. That's great, Andrew. Thank you for the contribution, mate. Do you want to come in on that, Ranji? Uh, can we take a few people's um, contributions and then I'll come back in a bit? I feel like I've spoken too much already. Mate. No worries. I'll go to Joshua Megan now, please. Just a moment. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Uh, can you see me? Actually, I'll stop. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Yes, I was just going to, uh, I think Ranji did sort of touch on the psychological mechanisms of, of capitalism about how it sort of, it you know, it, it encourages sort of, well, I'm going to expound on it further. It encourages sort of people, some, not everybody, but a lot of ordinary people to think that somehow capital, capitalism is the aspirational uh you know, is the aspirational concept because in theory you can have as much as you want, even though it's very unlikely. And I was just going to ask, how do we wean people off this idea? Because make no mistake, I do not think it is aspirational at all. It does quite the opposite in the overwhelming majority of cases. Only if you are uber talented or simply extremely lucky do you really make anything of yourself of any significance under the system we've got but so many people I think need to be weaned off this idea that um, you know like uh, capitalism is the given the material value that it could potentially offer potentially uh, it needs to be so we they need to be weaned off the idea that at, this is that this is unlikely while simultaneously not encouraging ordinary people to be less materialistic because of course most ordinary people cannot be that materialistic compared to you know an oligarch in uh, you know in in say new york or in london but how exactly do we encourage a working person to set to adopt the view that capitalism does not fulfill aspiration because it only has done so for such a small minority of people and yet while simultaneously encouraging them not to relinquish their material needs because we and and desires because we all do have that uh, what would you say do you get what i'm saying uh ranjit uh or do you do you do you, do you not follow how would we sort of strike that balance tread that tightrope is it is, if you see what i mean that's great thank you josh i'm just going to go to test now before we go back to ranjit thank you mate I 
Um, you reminded me, Ranji, of in my youth when I was well, hanging out a bit with the wrong crowd. We used to go around the backs of the supermarkets and nick all the stuff out the skip, you know, all the food and things. And my God, did we get chased? They, they, they didn't like that at all. It was all being thrown away. We used to go to Woolworths as well and get action men out there for the kids. But um, it was all being chucked away. But they, they didn't like it. They, they used to chase us off, and it wasn't given away. I suppose now they give things to food banks, but back then, twenty years ago, they didn't. And um, the other thing now is the, the labour, the way things work. Nothing matches anymore. You talked about what things are worth in comparison to each other, and in the system we're in now, nothing matches at all it, it does, it's not even close anymore N not even a, a little bit you know as far as housing things like that are concerned and the wages people get and the way that you you can only just get by it seems that's a, a deliberate thing to make sure that everyone is depressed and oppressed no one's got enough time to really think what's going on in their lives and perhaps make things better for themselves so i think it's deliberate Thanks. thank you very much tess are you happy to come back on those ranji uh, yeah, sure. Thank you. All really um, good, useful points, I think. Um, on, on, on the first contribution, I think basically capitalism creates a society in its own image. So capitalism, the capitalist create, it turns everything into a commodity. Everything can be bought and sold. All that is holy is profane. And I said, you know, it leaves no other connexus between man and man than cold-blooded calculation and the, and the cold cash nexus. So everything, capitalism has a price. And if you want some really obscene examples of that, you only have to reflect on the fact that there's a real trade in illegal organs. So that means that somewhere in the world, people are so impoverished that to feed their families, they think, well, rather than just die in the street, I may as well die after giving my kidney. And people go back and give both kidneys and are found dead having had both organs harvested but that's not a simple thing I mean somewhere there's someone in the world who is prepared to harvest that organ because there's real money involved there's someone who can put that into a system and market that organ and somewhere in the world someone is buying it and knowing that they're jumping any kind of queue and they can use their relative wealth in order to do so so that's pretty perverse uh, I saw went to a talk once on you, know, you can talk about the trade in 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 we weapons of death uh, when you know if 850 billion are sold by the uh, 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 are spent by the United States on weapons of armament, it's to reinforce the system of their ability to exploit the rest of the world. When that money could solve pretty much, <laughs> you know, the majority of major um, issues on the world. But of course, th those issues can't be solved. The problems of hunger, problems of malaria. Uh, problems of disease related to malnutrition that kills 40 million every year. Those can't be solved as long as we leave in place relations of production that allow one tiny class to accumulate the whole mass of social labor. And all of those subordinate, disgusting features we see of our society, drug problems, homelessness, 2% of Britons are homeless. We can reflect endlessly on these crises. Our politicians mention them. They come up with policies that apparently will make things better. But what they never do is challenge the fundamental distribution of wealth, the fundamental poverty, the fundamental production system, which leaves the whole of productive wealth and the whole of you know the land of this country. Why can't we build a hospital for social concentration of patients who have COVID in London? We take people who've got the disease, look after them well, and then they don't own the land. They can't do it. They have to beg to a capitalist. Instead, no, we're going to take 10 billion of the state money and give it to the private you know, system of health, health provision. So all of those disgusting social features, basically because capitalism turns everything into a commodity, you know, all the more previously considered inviolable professions that were respected, all gone, all hired, hired wage laborers. I, as a surgeon, I'm a hired wage laborer, a priest is a hired wage laborer whose job is to confuse the masses. Same with comedians are very <laughs> high-end uh, uh, laborers who give a certain entertainment value and distraction to the masses. You know, so everything has a value to the capitalists within their order. If you look at life itself, if you look at insurance tables, if you think of something that really disgusted you about Hitlerism and fascism, it was its, in, it's, it, it, you know, its endemic racism. 
that it valued one life above another, one race above another, one person above another. And it did so very explicitly in its political ideology. But if you look at insurance tables, how much um, and a life is assumed to be worth by the insurance industry, you can find a table according to nationality. And you'll find a German life is worth so much, an American life is so, worth so much, according to the average economic condition. So once a country is impoverished and oppressed enough, its people become very low value wage slaves of capital. And that's reflected to this real monetary value in terms of what happens if you kill one in an industrial accident. You have to give this much compensation because that's what they're worth. It's a very explicit way of showing that the capitalist values only, you know, he knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. Destroying our world to make short term profit is not sustainable. The economic problems we face, everyone can find quite simple solutions to them, but they're not in our power to really enact. We have to beg to the big industrialists, please do it. Well, they have to make profit. And if they're going to do it, you're going to have to give them profit in some other way. We have been made powerless by this current division of labor and the concentration of wealth into a tiny number of hands. And it does not have to be this way. So I think that's my answer to the first question. The culture. Everyone wants to be a billionaire. Well, of course, if you have a system where one class is removed from labor and has all the finer things in life, I mean, at a certain stage, they seem to be even superior form of human beings. It was the ruling class who could write. They very deliberately stopped the workers and peasants from being able to write and educate and have access to knowledge. You know, so they lived better lives, pampered lives. They lived longer. Everyone looks at the queen and says, isn't she well, isn't she amazing? She's 102, <laughs> the queen mother. And she looks so great for her age. She's never done a day's work in her life. Of course, she looks, <laughs> of course she looks great. She never wanted, she never suffered. She got the best health care. So this is the natural state of humanity, you know, not just of some ruling class, but we're deprived of that by our impoverishment. OK, so, of course, people look up to and aspire to a better life. Why do people, why is there mass migration from the hugely impoverished countries in which there's war and devastation into Britain and other first world countries? Because people want to escape the poverty and they're looking for a better life. The same reason people go economically from north to south traditionally because that was economically what they were forced to do by capital. They went where the job is, they go where the opportunity is. We're all the same, you know? Capitalists, of course, are not like us. They've got much more money, <laughs> but apart from that, they're the, they're the same, we're the same people. But people aspire to be a billionaire, and there's a culture associated with it. Get Rich or Die Trying is the genuine name of a rap album which sold millions of copies around the world to our youth. But that was also the ethos of Thatcherism. It's also the ethos of the Spice Girls. It's the ethos of capitalism. It's the ethos of your sports star is going to become, you know, have, have his own trainer deal. Nike Air Jordan, the best paid sportsman. So we attribute success. We associate success with money in our society. So aspiration to success and aspiration to money are almost the same thing to the point where we've generated a celebrity culture with these programs like Celebrity Big Brother, where people literally want to be a celebrity for celebrity's sake rather than to be good at anything, rather than contribute to society, rather than have some value to society, not even to be talented at anything. I just want to be on the telly because I'll be able to market and get money and money is seen as a way out of the problems of working people. So if they can't think beyond this system, they can only think of an individual way out. And the ideal is for us to join the exploiting class. Slaves themselves dreamed of becoming the slave owners. They dreamed of their freedom and becoming slave owners. Roman slaves who were free became slave owners. They didn't challenge the system. They personally were free. So this concept of becoming a billionaire as a way out simply shows that we're shackled in our minds to not being able to think beyond the commodity form of circulation, not to be able to think beyond capitalism. It's like we can't imagine a world without police. How can we have the police? Think what you'd be doing to yourself if there was no policeman. How can you trust your neighbor? How can you trust society? So you're conditioned to think in a certain way, but we have to, if we really want to liberate the mass of society, everyone can't become an exploiter. Everyone can't become a billionaire. By definition, we have to think about a different way of producing according to a plan where we realize wealth actually comes from our work by making everyone work together, by cooperating in our work, producing according to a plan, but we can actually give every human being a decent form of life and in that way liberate humanity, all the people who are actually impoverished. So this question about, you know, human nature. You know, if it's human nature to want to get rich, then people should have stopped working under the system a long time ago because in this system, wealth is, riches, you know, exist, property, private property, in the real things that create wealth, the means of production exist for a tiny minority 
by the fact that they have excluded and kicked out the vast majority from having them. So this concept, you know, we don't really own our nation. We don't really own our factory. We don't have a stake in production. We've become removed by our social position. We've got to recognize that we are the working class, not be ashamed of that, actually say, this is the ruling class in waiting. We are the only class with a future, but we have to change the ownership of the things that our labor creates and make it our common property. And that has to become a general desire. And changing that culture is part of growing a movement that can actually put those demands forward and make them popular, make them understood, cut through this nonsense of exploitative culture that we're giving, whereby the billionaire, of course, deserves all that money. It's the only way you can in induce him to produce is to reward him. You know, the CEO of a company, of course, has to have 100 million in remuneration, has to have 60 million as a golden uh, uh, handshake, has to have 60 million as a, as a golden goodbye. We can do nothing apart from reward the capitalist with more and more money. On the other hand, the laborer, the lazy, feckless laborer, by nature, needs the stick, needs to be beaten, needs to have the threat of starvation, needs to have the threat of being homeless, because without that, well, why will they work? Where's their incentive? So this dual incentive is just a mask for this class exploitation of capitalism. Um, in terms of wages and what makes the rate of wages, uh, we're going to cover um, a little bit next time. But it does. It, it, we'll just we'll just say in passing that the rate of wage is something which is historically negotiated and agreed between the worker and the capitalist. It's only by the worker banding together that they found they had the ability not to sink lower and lower to the state of absolute, you know, drudgery, not absolute drudgery. And it doesn't matter to the capitalist whether he has very unhealthy workers who live 30 years of age and die, so long as they're able to produce kids who can replace them at the factory, and we had that throughout the classical Dickensian period. They have that still in many places, okay? Very low life expectancy, very poor conditions of work. So low in investment in health and safety, all of those things that we're told that just get in the way and annoying, those things have been hard won by an organized working class to protect us from the rapacious and exploitative nature of capital, okay? Um, so as the workers combine, become more productive, strive to protect their rights, their wage goes up. It's the job of the capitalists constantly to try and depress their wages because depressing wages means that of the total quantity of commodities produced, fewer and fewer, so money is of course just a, an expression of the total produce of society. If you decrease the wages of the worker, you increase the profits of the capitalists. And conversely, it's the job of trade unions, it should be the job of trade unions to fight for, to collectively bargain for higher wages, not to say, well, you've set us a minimum wage, which is a penury wage, and we'd just be so happy if we can get that and find that actually we're sinking below it, lower it and lower it. It should be the job of the workers to seek constant increase in their wages, not a selfish thing to do. Every time there's a tube strike, the tube strike, the tube drivers, are relatively well paid because the RMT does its job. Most unions don't do their job. The RMT represents collectively the ability of the skill set of workers to get a wage, which means that they have a decent standard of life. And every time they have to strike to defend their pain conditions, the rest of the workers are told to alienate themselves, to, dis you know, to dissociate themselves, say these are greedy scroungers who are too lazy to work. That's nonsense. It's our job as workers to recognize that it's the job of workers to fight for increased paying conditions of workers to the point ultimately where we put businesses out of business. We have, should have no worry. We shouldn't be our job to make profits for the capitalists. If they can't survive, let them retire from the scene. We will run production for the working people, but we have to have that in mind, okay? That it's the job of unions to constantly push wages higher. If capitalists go out of business, that is no concern of ours. We are fighting for a greater share of the price that our labor has consumed and capitalists are not going out of business. The big capitalists, are killing the small capitalists and the capitalists become more and more powerful larger and larger monopolies that control a greater and greater share of the the, the market worldwide but they're not going out of business it's a very profitable time to be a big capitalist big capitalist the small capitalists small capitalists are forced into the ranks of the workers it's our job as workers not just to content ourselves with saying we, we please give us a few more pennies to constantly fight for increased wages and that's why you know it seems impossible for us to live. These are all products of this current prevailing system. We mustn't be fettered by the problem of capitalism, by their crises. We must look beyond it and say, this, you know, this is what we need. We need socialism. We need planned production. The wealth comes from our labor. If we work together, 
to a plan, we can produce what society needs and create a wealthy, cultured, meaningful life for all human beings. Fantastic, thorough answers, Ranjit. Thank you for that. Uh, gonna take another trio of questions then. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna ask Dave, who's a veteran of ours. Good evening, comrades, friends. Um, good evening, Ranjit. Thank you very much for an excellent talk there. I just wanted to just make a couple of points, if you don't mind. One slightly historical, because the subject of fascism was meant there, and I've dealt with this several times recently. Obviously, as socialists, we've always opposed fascism, as fascism is an ideology at odds with humanity, whereas socialist collective is a development of um, um, people. And for some reason, I always get thrown at me when I debate about Stalin and such. And the point is, obviously, the, the alliance there was brought about by Hitler. And we fought against Mosley in the 30s. My father was there. So I just wanted to move on to what I would say is the myth of the capitalist um, society, as in we've got richest countries, but what we don't see is that how many services, how many people are helped by volunteers, community groups, unpaid carers. I'm an unpaid carer myself. I'm not here to speak of myself because there's people worse off, but 67 pounds a week for one or two. These thousands, this money, these volunteers are used, such as victim support, Samaritans, community groups, faith groups, all these people. Everybody at some point needs care, and we're all requiring of that at some point. So if all these individuals, say just unpaid carers, had to be funded, the government would be in the biggest crisis ever why should a capitalist society have people sleeping rough carers going to food banks why are they still paying for prescriptions and on sort of a final note that i don't always what you views, but the media don't don't always help as in the sometimes give voice to quite right-wing ideas as in many of these carers themselves are on benefits, but we often hear from such about benefit sheets and benefit sheets and benefit street. But we don't often hear tax avoidance street, tax haven street, do we? So um, there's a couple of points there, but I just wanted to really override that with the uh, mention of fascism there and also the myth of the capitalist society and the hidden people that sort of keep it going. Thank you very much, Ranji. Thank you, um, comrades. Cheers for that, Dave. Um, Thank you. We're going to go from now our, from our moat medic to our moat teacher, Claire. Hello, is that okay? can hear you loud and clear, Claire. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ranjit. Um, and thank you very much, Dave. Um, that What you shared there, Dave, is, is one of the reasons why I think so many of us are passionate, uh, because it's the, it's the inequality and the inhumanity in our society, which is the fire, isn't it? And it's, with, it's, in, our, it's in our own communities, it's our, in our own families, if we're more and more of us. Um, who you know, and and also of course, if you, if you if you just glimpse at what goes on around the the globe, if you dare, um, and it's like this can't go on. Um, when you said that, Ranjit, about 
um, the striving, the way it's dangled in front of us, the striving for more and more wealth. I'm not at all sure it's, it's successful. And I think what's missing for me is an understanding of what's going on. I think the desire for change is, is there in society. I would like to say more than ever, but an understanding of the mechanism of how it's gonna come about puts people off. It's that thing of, like you shared, oh, communism would be great, but how are you gonna get it? And we can't allow that to stop us, can we? We can't allow that to, to be that, that mountain that's just too high to climb. Um, so we have to find a way of, uh, of keeping going, of realizing it's the good fight. Um, I think, I wanna say, they know they're losing and they know they're gonna lose. Otherwise, why are they throwing everything at us? The media, the culture they've got hold of, um, they've got everything on their side, haven't they? Because they need it. Because what they're doing is so out egregious. Um, and I think that their weapons have changed as society has changed, as education has, has opened up what they're doing. We're no longer feudal peasants who don't get it. We get it. So they just become more sophisticated in how they control us. Um, I don't know if that ties in with your talk, Ranjit, um, but I just feel that there's so much cause for optimism. Um, it, it, it's about that battle to force those with the power to give it up on the one hand, and then to, and then to make it clear, you know, where people's fight should be and where their energy should be. Okay, thanks. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Claire. I'm going to take a couple more questions since we're nearing the end now. Uh, if you're happy to take a few more notes, Ranjit, and uh, round it all up together. Uh, first of all, I'm going to read out a question from Kate, who asks, do you know anything about mixed monetary theory? And I'm now going to go to Sam, and then we'll finish off with Helen. Hello, Ranji. How are you doing tonight? Uh, so my first question, and my only question here today, uh, it, a little bit long, but it should cover all the notes that I wanted to share here. Uh, uh, but I'll ask this question simply. Should we learn to understand the approaches of modern market economies, such as free market economy, social market economy, and socialist oriented path market economies to which we can further dynamically contribute to our own path of socialism that fundamentally meets the times of peaceful development and trade with other countries based on mutual win-win common interests that are predicated on the ideas or the principles of multilateral uh, agreements open and transparent links to bilateral friendships and mutual cooperation with other countries, in which we can remodel our relationships with other countries on a foreign policy directive based on a, an anti-imperialist, uh, sorry, anti-imperialist criterion of which we oppose the forces of bullying tactics and methods of unilateralism. That is it. Thank you. That's, that's great. Thank you, Sam. I'm going to go to Helen now. Thanks, Ed. Um, I've just finished uh, an, eco an economics module on the Open University. Um, I'm a bit long in the tooth to be doing that for reasons I won't go into at this moment. Um, but um, I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit, Ranji, because... You mentioned about um, workers driving up wages. And I don't know whether to believe, I get so suspicious with everything in society at this moment and the establishment. I don't even know whether to believe 
what I'm learning about on a on a university course actually that's that's another thing so I'm just I'm just going to say but according to my course if the workers drive the wages up then the manufacturers and the companies put their profits up uh, put their prices up uh, so you've got inflation driving uh, wage bargaining driving up inflation and and so it's just swings and roundabouts and the workers never actually do get any any further with with um with their wage bargaining thank you that's great thank you uh before we come back to you ranji i need to just correct myself um kate's corrected me i think i might have asked do you know anything about mixed monetary theory she asked about modern monetary theory. So I hope that clears that up. Do you, want, do you want me to come in? Please. So thank you, everyone. Great to hear all of your contributions and points. Dave, thank you so much for sharing. Um, what is your, your harsh and difficult personal circumstances? And you're right. And I think I'm um, clear, I think it co coincides with the points you made as well, that human culture is much more than simply um, saying that wealth is the embodiment of everything. That is the Ayn Randian culture of the capitalists that they try and impose upon us. But humanity, you know, human beings are social animals throughout our entire history. And as we said last week, 95% of our history is pre-class society is predicated upon cooperation in order to survive. That's something that goes very deep in us and social satisfaction and feeling of achievement can't all be monetized and quantified no matter how much the capitalist culture tries to do so. So there's much more to our culture and I think it's deep in working class culture. The, rea the reality is there are two cultures in our society or many cultures, but two predominant forms of culture, a working class culture and a capitalist culture. And we need to increasingly build that working class culture. And it's very much part of building an effective working class movement. And I agree with you. There are many things that point to our success precisely at a time when the whole notion, uh, just, you know, being good, following your career, do your A-levels or don't do your A-levels, and you'll be awarded by an algorithm, a grade that is dependent upon your pre-existing class and society. So, so many things are blowing apart the notion that society currently, as it's currently arranged, and economics as it currently arranged, serves the interest of humanity in a sustainable way. You know, however you look at it, from whichever is your specialist interest, whichever is the cause that you like most, it's blown apart. And it's seen that the government we have is a government that represents the interests of the moneyed elite. And we need to find a way through that. Of course, we need to build a culture of unity around it. And I hope what I'm doing in revisiting what's not new to me, what wasn't invented by me, but is the, you know, it's the science of socialism laid down by generations is to returning to what should be the core themes of understanding so that we can all start to think with a common language and to appeal beyond our own simple ranks of people who've already joined, but to the wider working people of Britain and make them understand that what we're saying is not, you know, some airy fairy nonsense is based upon human culture and civilization, the real problems that we're facing and a common way through and achieving something together and a society which will really allow them to achieve their potential. So I hope that's what we are building. I think in terms of, um, I was asked specifically about modern monetary theory. So modern monetary theory is, is this essentially a concept whereby there is no inherent value to money, where it's just a perceived value that we agree and you can keep on printing money endlessly. We'll, we'll, and therefore the concept that you have to limit things. So when our chancellor comes and spends loads of money on businesses and then says, now we all have to rein in our belts. We're told this is an ideological choice. There's no such thing as budget deficit, it's not meaningful. Well, I'm afraid that that's not true. There are real debts. And as long as we have the system of capitalism, the a state basically must fundamentally budget, but balance its budget. But of course, it's not just an abstract state. The, the government as it stands doesn't just so, so serve the average working people any more than the police is there to protect and serve equally all people. And that's exposed in the, in the terms of the police at times of industrial crisis, when in the miners strike, they don't protect and serve the interests of the miners, they protect and serve the interests of the owners um, and the capitalists. 
and it's, and it's shown in the, by our government that every turn, all their policies serve the interests of the wealthy. So it's not about them having, not having to balance the books. Um, it's about them uh, serving the interests of the ruling class and putting the interests of working people at the bottom of the pile. And that's not an ideological choice so long as capitalism prevails, they have to do it. But anyone who serves a system of capitalism says they're going to preserve the system of capitalism and therefore preserve the inequality of wealth is powerless to change any feature of that ugly society irrespective of their best intentions and that's why i really um think it's necessary to return to the fundamentals of economics to back up what we're saying you know we can all build ideas of what's a more just society but we have to have an understanding of the way in which we're exploited um helen asked a specific specific question is it possible for workers to win more through strikes and the answer, yes it is <laughs> okay but it's the constant endeavor of eco uh, economists to tell workers don't strike don't work for more there was a, a mill strike in the 19th century in which the workers were trying to reduce their hours by one hour from 12 hours to 11 hours and a massive movement uh, was created with economists coming forward to show that the only time the poor mill owner made his profit was in that final hour of work and if you took away that final hour of work all profit would be destroyed and the entire system would be destroyed and of course if you destroy the wealth of the capitalists you destroy the mills and if you destroy the mills you destroy the workers and you'll get no wages so don't be greedy work make sure that you try and make your you know your boss a good amount of profit because then the wealth will trickle down it's always trickling down can you feel it trickle down <laughs> you know and so this is the this is basically what you're being taught and i'm afraid that is how eco economics is taught it's taught as a kind of voodoo where we were taught to think that oh it's the value of the thing is just how much we want it nothing more it's got nothing to do with work so we create we separate value and money we further fetishize money like it's a thing that has power over us and we've got to pray for the wealthy people to come and give us the money or what we do we'll be stuck without them look after the wealthy people that's the mantra that we're genuinely taught it's in the news it's in the press it's in the, your education it's in the economics taught to children the wealthy make the money they make the economy we've got to create a climate where the wealthy come into britain how do we create that climate well it's funnily it's linked to smashing wages down to a bare level of subsistence and yet those two are not kind of put together in the way it makes you see all wealth comes from our work and the billionaires are coming here because they can hide their money without taxation that they've stolen from workers all over the world. And while they're at it, why not employ a few sweatshop laborers in, uh, uh, what was the city that had the outbreak recently? Uh, 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 in the Midlands, it was Leicester, wasn't it? Leicester, a few, sweaters, few, few sweatshop laborers in Leicester while you're at it. Why not? There's the same, same as the third world laborer these days. Okay, so look, this is, this is what it's about, but, but there are, I, I can give you a lovely pamphlet called Wages, Price and Profit. I'll smash it out to you at some point, which goes through precisely these arguments, which are 150 years old. They're 150 years old, okay? And yet you're still being taught them in open university. Isn't it good? People who haven't got the money can go to you, can raise themselves up. But the, we, we value education. We value it so much. But education is class education. And just as it's the ruling class who, who make our culture, you know, it's why a rapper, Loki, who I quite like, who will rap about exploitation and imperialism, no one's heard of him and he's not pressed into money, but a rapper like 50 Cent who raps about get rich quick or die trying, you know, I'm a pimp, I'm all of this, you know, it's like, that is the culture which is bang, get out to the masses and make this guy a millionaire, that's what success means, okay, so the interests of the capitalists are promoted and their culture is promoted, the interests of the workers are demoted, yes, of course, Workers can have a bigger share of national income, and that's what it means to raise their wages. And the you know blow by blow accounting of that of just where, of how the capitalist system works has been well laid out, and we're going to go into that a bit more next time. I think it's a time and place to leave it. I'm sorry if I didn't answer all your questions, but this is a, a common you know it's not like I have all the answers and you don't. This is our common treasury of knowledge that we've got to share with a wider audience so that the workers realize it's not just their place to serve the interests of the very wealthy and sink lower and lower. It's possible to realize that all the wealth comes from us. We don't need the capitalists, they need the worker. They can never get rid of us as a class. 
we are capable of getting rid of exploitation of man by man and nation by nation and having more wealth because more of us will work and all wealth comes from work. Money is not an abstract thing. Money is a property, the value, the exchange value of a commodity that only pertains to this particular exchange value in this particular capitalist society. But value only can be expressed ultimately in terms of real goods that are produced. They're all produced by human labor. We can produce more of them if we work collectively, stop unemployment and workers can produce the enough a surfeit of goods to satisfy us materially, culturally, to all have a good standard of living and do so on a reproducible and sustainable basis. But in order to do so, we have to have real ownership of the means of producing wealth. That doesn't mean your toothbrush, that doesn't mean just your house. It means the real factories, mines, mills, land, the things that still produce wealth, the fisheries, the seas. This should be a common treasury for all, an idea as old as the diggers, but an idea in modern form that equates to a real socialist society with a real planned economy, which produces by our labor and distrib distributes according to the needs of working people. It can be done, it must be done, and we must put that at the heart of our agenda for building a real socialist party, a real socialist culture, which can energize this country and make an impact for working people here and spreading out across the world. So thanks all for joining, and I hope that we can uh, get together and continue this discussion next week. Thank you again, Ranjit, especially after a long day of surgeries. And thank you to everyone who gave contributions tonight and asked questions. So I couldn't get around to everyone who wanted to contribute tonight, but uh, there's always members meeting tomorrow. So everyone have a good evening and catch you soon.